It's super pleasure for me to introduce Claire Booth today. I think you're our most distant seminar speaker to date, which is one of the great things about COVID was that we started having, you know, some remote speakers, which has been awesome for us. So we can, people don't have to travel, but we still get to hear from leading immunologists around the world. So here's another one of those scenarios. Claire has done tremendous work in, in the field of um, immune deficiency diseases and really is sort of works in the arena that our division has is, is been bounded around and working in for years. So her interests really majorly overlap with our with ours. And and she's really been a leader across all like a, across um, immune deficiency therapies from transplant to gene therapy to other um, other approaches. And really her work really spans that whole clinical gambit. And and um, just to highlight a few of sort of her training, she she did her PhD um, and, a, and a fellowship at UC um, uh, at at UCL and and that PhD training actually is something now that's moving into a clinical trial. I don't, I don't know if Claire, you're going to talk about that today or not, but it's a, a lenti based gene therapy for XLP. Um, but she's also been a principal investigator on on at least ten clinical trials, um, either co or principal investigator, and at least ten clinical trials for immune deficiency diseases, and and more are, are coming down the pike, including the XLP study, and that has included um, X Skid, ADA Skid, um, with Scott Aldridge, um, and others. Um, she's currently the Malbobian. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing this correctly. Claire, professor in gene therapy and pediatric immunology at UC um, uh, UCL um, and and the Institute of Child Health there. And not only um, has Claire been sort of leading these clinical trials and and reporting on the outcomes with 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 these trials, but she's also begun to kind of lead um, the European groups in trying to figure out how to to make these trials feasible for rare diseases um, based upon the challenges with the cost structure and the rarity of the diseases. And I think she's gonna also highlight some of that work um, in her talk today too. So um, really a pleasure to hear from you, Claire, and thanks for doing this. Well, thanks so much for inviting me and putting me early in the morning. Um, and thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about, well, what about, it's about the evolution of gene therapies for inborn errors of immunity. Um, hang on a second, let me just move that. So these are my disclosures and my other disclosures which aren't on here is that I'm not going to talk about T regulatory cells. Um, I'm doing this from home and there may be interruptions from dogs, children or delivery people. Um, and um, also um, that half of this talk is not going to be scientific. It's going to be about the access issues that Dave um, kind of was referring to. Um, so I don't need to spend much time on the background for, for these slides. As you know, inborn errors of immunity, there's more than 400 of these disorders now, um, and they're all rare or ultra rare or orphan diseases. Um, and um, many forms are amenable to, to, to bone marrow transplant, uh, and some of them can be treated with gene therapy. And the very basics of gene therapy, as I'm sure all of you are aware, um, this was the stem cell gene therapy approach that bone marrow cells are removed from the patient. The CD34 cells are enriched, uh, are selected for, the cells are incubated with a virus containing the transgene of interest. The cells take up that gene and then they're returned to the patient, usually after some form of uh, chemoreductive protocol. Um, and this was originally developed as an alternative to mismatch stem cell transplantation and where the risks of transplant were increased uh, because gene therapy completely avoids any risk of allo-reactivity in GVH. And we can usually use reduced conditioning compared to a stem cell transplant, so it was a less toxic protocol. And there have been many, many improvements over the 20 or so years that we've been doing this for inborn errors of immunity uh, uh, relating to some of these aspects. So vector design, for example, code and optimization of the cDNA transgene has really improved our expression profiles. Um, we can now really effectively mobilize peripheral blood stem cells so we can give patients a greater cell dose. 
Um, we've got shorter optimized transduction protocols and transduction enhancers, so we can uh, give kind of the best quality of stem cell back to the patients. Um, we've got cryopreservation now, uh, which allows us not only to ensure that we have uh, a good product to give back to our patients, but it also allows us to do targeted conditioning regimes, uh, ensuring that we can secure engraftment and minimize toxicity. Um, and, you know, we've had some commercial partners involved in this um, in this area over the past five to 10 years, which has really also accelerated to some extent um, uh, what we've been able to do. But I think we're still at a point where we have uh, a need for more data and more understanding to really understand like which patients will benefit most from gene therapy. <clears throat> And I think we can't ignore as, as, as gene therapists, um, you know, the improvement in the stem cell transplant world at the same time. Um, you know, the alternative donor transplants with TCR alpha beta depletion, for example, um, you know, have significantly improved outcomes from mismatched donors and alternative donors with, um, you know, outcomes and survival up to 90% in, in certain centers. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to gather more data and understand which patients will benefit. But for example, in that paper from uh, Jackie in 2018, you can see that in the presence of infection and transplant in patients with inborn errors of immunity, um, you, the, the mortality is, is, is vastly different. So perhaps these are the patients who might benefit more from gene therapy. It'll depend on disease, the clinical manifestations, the age of the patient and the comorbidities. Um, but ultimately, we need to you know, treat more patients to understand um, who we should be treating. And I kind of want to start with this slide because this is, I think, a really um, striking example of like how far we've come in this field in the past 20 uh, years or so. And this is just an overview of the current and planned uh, SCID trials uh, across, across the different places. Um, so for, for ADA, we've got two different um, products uh, um, kind of available. Uh, we've got for XSCID, we've got three trials, uh, uh, two trials around and even gene editing coming to the fore. And we're tackling what I would consider more complex forms of SCID as well. So Artemis SCID and RAG SCID, um, you know, we've got trials for both of those uh, open at time. So I think, you know, we're in a really exceptional place uh, considering the, the um, where we started 20 years ago. And I'm going to start with um, X-Link SCID um, because I think this is a really good example of how we've learned over the years um, uh, how to improve both the safety and the efficacy of gene therapies. So if we think back to the first X-Link SCID trials uh, here um, in, in the 90s um, where it was a gamma retroviral vector uh, with the IL-2 receptor gene driven by those viral LTRs, um, 20 patients treated, 10 in Paris, 10 in London, 18 out of 20 got T-cell reconstitution. So for the first time, you demonstrated that T-cells were being able to be produced and they were functional, um, but the B-cell function was poor in this cohort and many needed to remain on immunoglobulin. Uh, 17 out of 18 survived, but a number of these patients, so six in total, developed leukemia as a result of the gene therapy procedure due to the insertional oncogenesis. So once it was realized what was the mechanism behind that oncogenesis, the vector was changed and moved to a self-inactivating gamma retroviral construct with an EFS promoter, so a mammalian promoter, driving expression of the human uh, IL-2 receptor gene. Um, and so this was an international trial uh, of this vector um, in, uh, in these centers listed here. So 14 patients treated, um, 13 of them didn't receive any conditioning. One patient did receive Bucelfan conditioning. Again, these patients showed excellent T cell recovery, and, but only one patient had B cell uh, uh, function, and that was the patient who received conditioning. So that told us that these patients needed to be conditioned to allow for engraftment of B cells. And there have been no reports of insertional oncogenesis to date, so that does look like um, a safe effector. But we've subsequently moved on now to a self-inactivating lentiviral vector, again with transgene expression driven by the EFS promoter, again an international effort, um, and more than uh, two centers are, are looking at this with slightly different kinds of vectors, which I'm sure you're aware of uh, being, being one of the sites. But again, you know, seeing fantastic T cell reconstitution, in these patients and we're seeing B cell reconstitution because we're using consistently low dose B cell fan conditioning to secure engraftment at the stem cell level. All of these patients are alive, none have had um, insertion or mutagenesis and uh, we're still open and enrolling uh, on, on the trials in the UK. 
And I'll just show you some of the results that we've had um, uh, from, from these trials. Um, so this is the vector that we're using, um, and it's for patients who don't have a sibling donor, and there's no contraindication to busulfam. Uh, we do autologous uh, mobilized uh, leukophoresis for these patients. We tend not to do bone marrow harvest because we get a, a, a less good result. CD34 selection, transduction with our vector, and cryopreservation. And then the patients will come in for targeted busulfam with an AUC of 30, uh, the product's cryopreserved, uh, are thawed, and, and um, it's infused into the patient. Um, we have two years uh, follow-up on the on the protocol, and then moved to a long-term follow-up protocol with survival uh, of gene and with gene marked T cells at one year as the primary endpoint. Um, and so these are the patients that we've uh, treated so far. We've enrolled 16 patients and actually infused all of these now. Uh, but you can see that there are a range of different um, centers and a range of different mutations. Um, and most of these patients have a classic SCID with no CD3s um, at uh, presentation. Uh, they get, uh, most of them have been picked up by newborn screening, I would also say. Um, the patients get a good cell dose with a good uh, copy number. You can see that we started using transduction enhancers after the first couple of patients. Um, and there was only one patient in this cohort treated in UCLA who had a uh, bone marrow. Uh, we've got significant follow up on these patients now up to five years. And I'll just show you a little bit about their immune reconstitution. Um, what you can see is that all patients uh, have rapid and robust development of T cells. And you can really see that at three months, those T cells just essentially come up uh, to uh, within the normal range. And we see that across CD3, CD4s, uh, naive cells, uh, and also CD8. So that's um, a, a really great result. And it's also a durable effect up to uh, 24 months in those patients who've reached that long. What we all, uh, Sung Young also, um, Sung Young Pai at NIH also um, uh, compared the recovery uh, to uh, allo transplant at six months and, and demonstrated superiority both in the CD3 and the CD4 counts. Um, so the CD3 count over a thousand in the gene therapy patients was 100% versus 50% in patients receiving transplant. And the CD4 count over 500 at six months was again 100% in the gene therapy group compared with 50% uh, in the transplant group. Um, and when we compare to the previous trial using a syn gamma retroviral vector, again, we just see that this vector is superior um, and the CD3, the CD4 and the NK cell numbers at two, year, uh, two years are, are higher than in the previous trials. So again, it just shows uh, progress in the, in the way that we've changed the vector. And now that we've introduced conditioning, we see sustained gene marking in neutrophils. Uh, we see that um, out, you know, as you can see, uh, here, you know, very stable gene marking. This is from the old syn gamma retroviral trial where there was no conditioning, and this was kind of the conditioning that we see now. You can see um, you know, significant stem cell engraftment, and that's borne through as well to B cells, um, just showing that sustained gene marking in B cells is indicative of stem cell uh, correction, but also of, of B cell function. So, um, so nine of the 10 patients who are far enough out from the gene therapy procedure have come off immunoglobulin replacement, and all of the patients who are far enough out to have been vaccinated have responded to those vaccines. So, you know, really, this is a, a fantastic uh, result. So, using our, our, our syn lentiviral vector with this code and optimized IL-2 receptor gene and low-dose B-self, and it was safe and effective in the 15 patients, 16 patients that have been infused to date with 100% survival and no safety concerns. And again, the addition of that conditioning has just secured the B-cell engraftment, and these, these patients are doing you know, fantastically. And I think you've probably seen the same thing with your, your trial um, using a slightly different vector. So my further conclusion is that basically lentivirus is great. Um, you know, it's effective. Uh, we know how to use it safely. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's not going away. So I, I consider Artemis SCID probably one of the more complex SCIDs um, because of kind of the autoimmune and the dysregulation that we see in this. But as you know, Mort Cowan has, 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 has previously um, reported some fantastic results using lentiviral gene therapy for this. Um, they published a while ago now uh, 10 patients um, who had a median age of infusion of 2.7 months, mostly again picked up by newborn screening, using this lentiviral vector with the bone marrow prom uh, Artemis promoter. But they're using bone marrow as a starting material rather than peripheral blood, but again using a low-dose B sulfan to secure engraftment of um, gene-corrected stem cells. Um, one of the patients required two infusions who had a, a CMV encephalitis, but they've got significant follow-up now, and obviously it's longer than, than three years, um, and they're seeing still consistently good results with that. 
um, as these you know, these um, graphs pretty much mimic what I, I showed you in the XGID trials as well, just very fast T cell reconstitution that's durable over time and uh, yeah, a little bit more variable B cell reconstitution, um, but certainly um, uh, you know, a great naive population uh, in, in general as well. What interestingly they did see in this uh, in this trial though was a, a reasonably high incidence of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So four out of those ten patients developed it um, post therapy, thought to be T cell mediated, and responded well to treatment. And they haven't seen any clonal expansions or any concerning um, kind of features uh, related to genotoxicity. And I really like this this figure particularly because uh, you know, it just shows so so nicely graphically the the normalization of the v beta diversity in these patients before and after treatment um you know so this is something again that's just working uh working so well so i think for skid um yeah we've we've, we've got it sorted we've got lentiviral vectors that work really well these patients you know the corrected cells have a survival advantage and essentially these patients can go on to live a, a normal life afterwards but what about the non-skid diseases so i'm not going to talk about uh, really WISCO or cgd because a lot of that work is is very much published i was just going to show you some results of trials that we've been involved in um, that that i would consider non-skid diseases so one of them is a, a trial that we've done in collaboration with rocket pharma um, for leukocyte adhesion deficiency type one and this was for patients with severe LAD. Um, again, it's a disease you're probably familiar with, um, but this was a non-randomized global uh, phase one, two study, and it enrolled patients who had severe LAD, so less than 2% CD18 expression um, in, in, uh, in, in cells, um, and they had to obviously have a documented um, ITGB2 mutation and a significant history of infection. I mean, it was primarily a, a safety and preliminary efficacy study, uh, but obviously looked at a lot of things, including durability of uh, neutrophil CD18 expression, vector copy number, um, and sort of hospitalization and events. And so these are the patients that have been treated. And you can see, again, like a wide range of age groups here, um, uh, but all received a good cell dose and a well-transduced um, uh, cell product. So the study enrollment's completed now and all, all the subjects have been treated. Um, what we can see is a really strong genotype phenotype uh, correction after the gene therapy. Uh, we see a stable uh, vector copy number in uh, PBMCs, um, and we see also very stable C18 expression um, in, in those cells as well. So that's kind of the, 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 the molecular correction. Um, but what does that mean for the patient? So we've got 100% um, overall survival without having to move to transplant uh, more than uh, two years of age and more than one year post um, post infusion of, of the gene therapy product. But I think this is a really this is a really nice graph looking at the incidence of prolonged hospitalization. So more than seven days of hospitalization. And you can see that pre gene therapy, uh, you know, that was that was significant for these patients. Uh, but afterwards, it's really dropped uh, practically to uh, to nothing. Um, so that's really gratifying. And inborn errors of immunity can be difficult to kind of show visually um, how effective these treatments can be, but this is a, a slide I like because I think it shows that really well. This is a patient that Don Cohn treated uh, at UCLA with LAD1 um, who had these spontaneous abdominal skin lesions um, that really were refractory to any treatment. Uh, and you can see at baseline uh, significant lesions which just uh, kind of melted away uh, over time after the gene therapy and hasn't had any more of those spontaneous skin lesions. So so um, yeah, I think that's a nice, um, <clears throat> you know, it's nice obvious demonstration of the clinical impact of these gene therapies. So all of the nine patients have been treated, and actually the follow-up's more than two years now. It's uh, probably a little over that. Um, and the infusions have been really well tolerated. We haven't had any drug product-related SAEs. Um, the integration site profile is very highly polyclonal with no concern around uh, clonal dominance. And in terms of efficacy, um, uh, this was reported with seven patients who had more than a year follow-up, but all of them had sustained more than 10% CD18 uh, expression and, and CD11 expression, which correlated uh, with vector, vector copy copy number, 100% survival, a significant reduction in infection and inflammatory related hospitalizations, um, and then evidence of the spontaneous resolution of, for example, like the periodontal disease and the skin rashes that, that are common in these kind of diseases. <clears throat> and I want to tell you about a trial that's going to be opening at, well, it is open at Great Woman Street now, and it's going to be opening at NIH soon. Um, and this is for P47 Fox deficient CGD. So this is the autosomal recessive form of, of CGD that, for us anyway, is the second most prevalent um, 
we're using a very similar promoter to what has been used actually in the LAD trial and previous um, trials, which is a self-inactivating lentiviral vector with a codon optimized form of the uh, P47 Fox gene driven by a chimeric promoter. It's a myeloid specific promoter composed of myeloid specific transcription factors uh, driving that transgene expression. And so when we tested this on patient cells, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, which we differentiated out and were able to do a DHR on, uh, we saw that with increasing copy number, you got improved um, correction and, uh, and basically a, a DHR result that was comparable to a wild type. And when we tested this in a mouse model, we were able to demonstrate stable long-term correction. And also when you challenge these corrected mice with a salmonella infection, they were able to, uh, to fight that off. So uh, for example, this is the, the, the bacterial counts in the spleen, in a wild type mouse, and in a transplanted mouse on our, our gene therapy. So all the preclinical data was supportive of moving forward to a clinical trial, uh, which uh, we have now uh, opened. Um, and it's going to include patients who are over six months with a confirmed molecular diagnosis, genetic diagnosis, and less than 5% DHR positive neutrophils. They have to have had at least one severe CGD related infection or inflammatory complication. Um, and they have to have no 10 on 10 uh, match related donor available for transplant. Similar to the previous protocols that we've been using, we're using a cryopreserve product and we're using myeloablative fusar fund conditioning, similar to what we did in the XCGD trial, uh, targeting an AUC of 75. And our primary endpoint is going to be uh, engraftment of gene modified cells, which we're classifying as over 10% oxidase positive cells at six and 12 months. And of course, we're going to look at secondary endpoints around safety and efficacy as well. <clears throat> so in the context of stem cell lentiviral gene therapy, you were doing really well. We've got long-term follow-up trials which are showing durability to these uh, treatments. We've got you know, more than you know, three open trials for ex-SCID, other forms of SCID, autosomal recessive CGD. Um, there are other trials that are going to come soon in this context, hopefully with XLP and perforin deficiency. And then maybe in the future, moving towards uh, gene editing trials. But I think Lenti has still got, um, you know, a, a, a lot of use uh, still in this field. But we are looking at new approaches. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a proof of concept for T-cell gene therapy, which is, I know, something that you guys are also interested in. Um, and we've seen the proof of concept demonstrated in preclinical models for IPEX. Um, for CD40 ligand deficiency, MONC13-4, perforin deficiency, and XLP. And we've also got proof of concept really from CAR T cells demonstrating that you can have long-term persistence of stem cell memory, uh, stem cell memory compartment, uh, and also um, you know, up to 10 years durability from the CAR T trials that we've seen. And T cell gene therapy has got some advantages. You know, the cells are easy to harvest. You don't have to mobilize these patients. We can get really high transduction and editing efficiencies in T cells. And because we're using a lymphodepletion that's usually combining fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, much like the CAR T protocols, it's a less toxic conditioning regime than a stem cell transplant. Um, it can be thought of potentially as a bridge to therapy, but we're hoping that we may be able to demonstrate a more durable effect for these therapies. And I'm going to talk to you about it in the context of XLP, which is SAP deficiency, because this is what I worked on in my PhD that's now kind of moving to clinical trial. Um, the gene responsible for this has been identified as SH2D1A, which encodes the SLAM associated protein or SAP. And this is an adapter molecule that's critical in immune functioning in T, NK, and NKT cells. Um, and it can act in an inhibitory or an activatory manner, depending on the cell type and the receptor. But it's got quite a tightly regulated expression profile. Um, it's got very heterogeneous features um, and presentation um, and no genotype phenotype correlation, which has made uh, designing a clinical trial quite tricky. Um, but, you know, these patients develop HLH, uh, lymphoma, uh, discamoglobin anemia and other uh, kind of autoimmune and immune dysregulatory issues. And what's highlighted on the right, those figures is the mortality associated with those presentations. So even, um, uh, you know, even like, for example, discamoglobin anemia has a significantly high mortality of around 13%. Um, but when we think about what are the immune abnormalities in XLP, actually, they're mostly related to the T cell compartment. So we see impaired cytotoxicity of CTLs, impaired restimulation induced uh, cell death in CD8s, and uh, the CD4 T follicular health cell population is abnormal, leading to impaired germinal center uh, responses and uh, humoral immune defects. 
So we thought that a T-cell approach might be possible for this condition. Um, for my PhD, I spent doing stem cell gene therapy approach for this using lentiviral vectors. And although we didn't see any cytotoxicity uh, or any toxicity related to expression at the stem cell level, we thought that this would be uh, a novel approach to try. So we demonstrated in the mouse model and in patient cells that transfer of gene corrected T cells can correct the uh, humoral immune defects. We're using a very similar lentiviral vector uh, with an EFS uh, promoter that's been used in previous trials, driving codon optimized SAP expression. And we used the GFP reporter gene for this. For the mouse work, we used the gamma retroviral vector because the mouse T cells don't get transduced by lentiviral. Um, but this just shows you um, uh, the, the germinal center formation abnormalities. So in knockout mites, when you uh, immunize them with MPCGG, which is a T cell dependent antigen, um, they don't, oh, sorry, I lost my marker. They don't form uh, any germinal centers, but as you can see, the wild type do. Those receiving just a GFP control vector don't develop germinal centers, but you see them restored uh, in the knockout mice. And when we did uh, in vitro T follicular helper cell um, uh, assays, um, again, uh, using T cell dependent antibody responses, we saw an improvement in patient corrected cells in IL-21, IgG and IgM, which were our readouts, which demonstrated an improvement in those humoral defects. And we also showed improvement in the overall TFH population. And we wanted to know whether though we could also correct the cytotoxic defects. Um, and we did this both in vitro and in vivo. Um, and so this is a chromium release assay demonstrating uncorrected patient cells with absolutely no cytotoxicity. Uh, wild type cells and then our gene corrected T cells. Uh, and so we put some of those patient T cells into a murine model where we had engrafted uh, an EBV LCL tumor, which you can you can see here with the luciferase um, assay. So these are uh, mice who had the tumor engrafted and received uncorrected patient cells. That tumor kind of still uh, is there or progresses. And in patient corrected cells, we saw that um, kind of melting away. So we spent a lot of time doing the kind of GMP uh, translation of this to clinical trial, uh, which we're going to be opening in um, uh, later this year, the Q4 uh, of this year. We're going to be recruiting seven patients uh, who don't have a matched sibling donor available for transplant um, and using our endpoints um, of, uh, uh, of basically persistence of gene corrected T cells um, at six months and also safety as the, as the sort of you know, primary um, uh, aim of the study. So I'm, I'm not going to go into much detail around kind of the gene editing techniques because I think you're probably all familiar with them. Uh, but, you know, is, is gene editing the future? Um, so I don't know. Um, I think for the conditions that we look after where you require this double stranded break and rely on HDR to insert a, a, a template, corrective template, um, you know, we're still some way away from, from moving that to clinic for the kinds of disorders that, that I work with. Um, but obviously, you know, we, we've gone through these different platforms, originally zinc finger nucleases, Talens, and now CRISPR-Cas, um, you know, which can, can help with that. Um, and just to, to show you a bit of background on that, um, you know, again, XGID was chosen as a, as a target disease for this because of the amazing survival advantage that, that the corrected cells have. Uh, so Pietro Genovese in, in Luigi Nardini's lab was the first to show correction of XGID by zinc finger nucleases uh, targeting early in the, in the exon. And they showed that really less than 10% correction um, is sufficient to correct the disease phenotype because of that selective advantage. And using these uh, XGID mouse models and humanized mouse models, they were able to demonstrate that you could uh, generate uh, T cells and that those T cells were functional. And then Matt Portis's group went on to do exactly the same thing essentially with the CRISPR-Cas system and again was able to show like high levels of targeted integration in, in the stem cells um, and put these in, a, in, a, in, a, in an SG model and showed recovery of hematopoietic lineages. Um, but, but really also highlighted that we needed better protocols uh, for editing um, stem cells ex vivo to preserve the kind of stemness and increase the edited the engraftment of edited HSCs. So make sure we're really hitting those long-term progenitors that are going to give some durability to, to the clinical results. Um, we also, uh, and, and Adrian Thrasher's group and Alessia Kavatsa's group also um, looked at gene editing for whisker audric syndrome uh, after this using the CRISPR system, uh, CRISPR-AAV, and looked at this both in whisker uh, uh, stem cells and uh, T cells and actually compared it in these uh, examples to the Wiscott lentiviral vector that we had in trial at that time. So this is a, 
uh, Lenti, um, a Lenti um, vector with a, a 1.6 Wiscott uh, promoter uh, in that. Um, and really was able to demonstrate um, very nice um, Wiscott expression comparable to, to wild type and even superior, as you can see here, uh, to, the, um, to the Lenti virus that was in trial. And looking at um, uh, looking at T cells was able to uh, improve uh, WASP expression and function as well. So taking WASP T cells and editing them with a CRISPR AAV system, uh, and then uh, expanding them, uh, and then um, reactivating them, and was able to look at IL two production and gene expression. And again, just demonstrated really high levels of targeted insertion and expression. So if we look at this one, which is the kind of best construct, is significantly higher um, uh, with got expression than uh, a percentage of got expression on cells than with the lenti viral vector. And again, kind of improved IL-2 secretion. So this was really promising. Uh, and again, this is something that is being translated through to uh, a clinical trial. And since then, we've also been uh, able to develop new tools more i guess more sophisticated tools but these are tools like base editing and prime editing which don't instigate that double-stranded break so i think really limits to a certain extent the diseases that we as immunologists can correct um because i think that you know kind of focusing on private mutations uh, or, or hotspot mutations which is what prime editing base editing is really focused on at the moment um yeah it's, it's, it's not a very um effective way to to treat all of these patients but it is uh, you know, fantastic fascinating technology to to work with um, and hopefully in the future we may develop ways of being able to either change the regulatory process so that this does become a feasible model or um, find ways of um, sort of increasing the corrective template that we can. And just to give a couple of slides on the on the editing, I'm sure you, you've seen this as um, an, an example of base editing for, for SCID. Um, so this was uh, Grace McCauley with, in Don Cohn's lab published uh, last year with adenine base editing for CD3 uh, Delta. Um, and, uh, and basically, they showed that base uh, the base editing really targeted this uh, CD3 delta hotspot that was seen. Um, and, and once you corrected that, they could restore T lymphoparesis and, and TCR diversity. Um, they were able to you know, get over the double positive, the, the block um, at the double positive precursor stage and show differentiation into mature T cells and showed that it was superior to HDR. Uh, in the correction of, of CD3 uh, uh, delta skid. Uh, so that again, I think is something that Don is, is trying to move forward towards the clinic. Um, but obviously, you know, the population of patients where that's going to be applicable is, is very small. And that's the challenge that I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. And then we've got other trusted diseases, CGD, XCUD, P47, that again are being um, you know, targeted with base editing and prime editing. And we're seeing uh, lots of positive results coming out through this. Um, this is just a snapshot from Prime Medicine, um, who have, I, they, you know, they, they've uh, talked about these results at various meetings. Um, they're focusing on a specific mutation in P47 CGD. Um, and again, you know, it, it's a single mutation, um, but they've demonstrated in this model, you really good results um, of edited CD34 cells in grafting nicely in the murine model with levels of over 90% from four donors and no detective off-target activity. So I think that, you know, that may move to clinical trial, um, which will be certainly interesting because I think it is important to be able to test um, you know, these um, methods in vivo because that's the only way that we're really going to uh, learn more about this. And then therapeutic gene editing T cells, I'm just going to uh, kind of uh, skip over because I know this is an area that you guys work on as well. Um, but you know, many people have considered parallel edited stem cell and T cell approaches. Um, Pietro Genovese, I think, uh, first showed in uh, the CD40 ligand deficiency that actually when you compared a T cell a gene edited approach to a stem cell gene edited approach, you know, they were pretty equivalent. Um, and, uh, and the ones that we focused on in, in our lab is XLP and, and C2A4 uh, insufficiency. Um, and then you guys have been working on IPEX and there's some work also in, in the familial HLH. Um, I'm not going to talk about XLP editing that, that's published and we're moving forward with the Lenti approach, but I will spend um, a couple of slides talking about C2A4 uh, haplo insufficiency. Um, so uh, as you probably know, um, CTLA4 is a critical um, negative immune regulator that's expressed constitutively on Tregs and on activated um, conventional T cells. <clears throat> and it competes with CD28 for the shared ligands of CD8T and CD86, which are expressed on antigen-presenting cells. 
Um, so CTLA-4 binds its ligand, then removes uh, them from the APCs in a process called transgender cytosis, which is a process that we can assess through in vitro assays, which we utilized uh, to demonstrate, uh, you know, the work, some of this. Um, and this is the work of uh, Tom Fox, who was a really talented, he's an adult haematologist and a really talented a PhD student, now postdoc. Um, and this work is all published in Science Translational Medicine, so I'm going to go over it pretty quickly. Um, but just to show you, uh, this was demonstrating the feasibility of editing the CTLA-4 locus precisely. So he generated um, several guide RNAs, and you can see here the allele specificity uh, designed to repair this disease-causing mutation, the specific uh, 371 um, A to C uh, point mutation. Uh, and with guide one was targeting the wild type allele. So you can see a knockdown of CTLA-4 and with guide two, which targets the mutant allele, there's no knockdown in healthy cells. Um, and he successfully knocked in a GF peak set um, with uh, HDR rates of over 50%. <clears throat> and then in collaboration with Pietro Genovese's lab, uh, we designed a universal editing approach to capture really as many mutations as possible because, as I said, it's kind of not clinically uh, feasible yet to design uh, for each specific mutation and adopted this intronic approach so as not to disrupt the open reading frame. And he designed a number of um, AAV6 donors uh, similar to, to that one shown here, and he tested the 3' UTR element alongside WPRE. Uh, and you can see here um, that the donor template containing the WPRE reproducibly mediated higher editing efficiencies. So guide four and donor four approach was, um, <clears throat> was taken forward. <clears throat> Sorry. And this schematic just shows the transendocytosis assay, which we use to assess the ability of CD4 T cells by flow to perform CTLA-4 uh, recycling, so mediated transendocytosis. So monitoring <clears throat> the internalization of mcherry labeled CD80 and 86 ligands expressed on the surface of these um, DG75B cells. Um, and we gated on CD4 cells, and all of this is done in healthy donors. But you can see evidence of um, transendocytosis in the upper right quadrants of the top plots. Um, let me just try and get this. Uh, yeah here, which knockdown abolishes. And then you see um, with our intronic approach in the guide four and the donor four, we see kind of restoration of that. Uh, and he took this forward and kind of corrected a murine model as well. So mice were analyzed after four weeks um, of, of T cell uh, transfer. And we'd already um, seen stable GFP expression in the CD4 compartment um, over that experimental time period. Um, and to assess lymphoproliferation, the cellularity of lymph nodes and spleen were analyzed. Um, and even from these images, you can see that the wild type mice and those receiving GFP um, uh, corrected cells have got much smaller spleens and lymph nodes um, than, than those receiving the mock vector. Um, and these GFPT regs honed uh, to the lymph nodes and spleens, as we would hope. Um, so he showed that edited CTLA-4 T cells could survive in vivo, express CTLA-4, and control the clinical phenotype. Um, yeah, really providing a, a proof of concept for moving this forward to trial, which is, which is what's happening at the moment. And so we're hoping to take that forward. So just thinking about the challenges of, of gene editing, you know, I think you know, the efficiency of, of targeted gene addition is, is still, um, you know, it's, it's still got some room for improvement. Um, we have to be able to correct the relevant hematopoietic progenitors efficiently. Off targets, we don't really know what's the best way to analyze them. And we also don't know whether they matter if we find them. I think that's really only going to be borne out through the in vivo testing and clinical trials. GMP scalability is a you know, significant issue as well, cost and accessibility. And that's where I'm going to kind of stop talking about the science and move over a little bit to, you know, we've got this great science, how do we uh, make sure that we can get it to patients in a sustainable way? So I don't need to tell you guys that gene therapies are transformative. You know, we've seen this for life-threatening immune deficiencies and devastating metabolic conditions. Um, this is Reese Evans. He was the first patient treated at GOSH with X-linked SCID uh, on the gamma retroviral trial uh, uh, well over 20 years ago now. And this was him, age 21, trekking in the Himalayas. Um, you know, so this is really uh, you know, an effective and durable treatment. And we've seen it over and over again. And often in the press, you know, it's called a cure, which I think that many of us are comfortable calling it. Um, so if we have a curative treatment for a rare and devastating disease, we absolutely have a responsibility to make sure that patients can have access to those therapies. And that's what we're seeing is that these effective therapies aren't reaching patients for non-medical reasons. So despite over 150 clinical trials of gene therapy, we have only a handful of licensed therapies. And even once these therapies are licensed, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can get them to patients. So we're currently asking ourselves these questions. 
how do we get currently effective therapies to patients and how do we change things so that we can continue to develop and deliver new cures? So I'm sure you're familiar with the traditional drug development pathway. Um, you have this sort of the early preclinical stage with your in vitro and in vivo testing, your clinical development with the clinical trials, your FDA review and data review, and then your post-marketing surveillance. Okay, so normally I'm in a room with people so I can actually pick on people and say, how much do you think that costs to do that traditional drug development pathway? So I can't do that. So I'm just going to ask you to kind of think of a number. Um, and I'm going to tell you that in 2018, it cost $2 billion to bring a new drug to market. And it took about 10 to 15 years. So if you look at this graph, instead of getting cheaper and being quicker to bring drugs to market, it's actually getting more expensive and taking longer. And licensing isn't even the end of the journey. This is a UK setting, uh, but even here, uh, once you've received your licensing or your marketing authorization, you have to go through the process of HTA assessment and reimbursement before you can essentially prescribe that drug in the context of the NHS. So I think we have a traditional view of inequitable access for drug therapies, uh, particularly advanced therapies with um, you know, more developed countries having access and uh, low and middle income countries having less access. And if you think about sickle cell disease, this has been a major target for gene therapies and gene editing technologies over the past uh, you know, few years. Uh, but this is a disease, you know, it's got a huge market population, uh, but this is a disease that you know, disproportionately affects patients in low and middle income countries. Um, fortunately, there's innovative approaches, which I know some of you guys are also involved in with the, the GGTI around you know, point of care. And, and you know, in Uganda, they've started up uh, gene therapy trials for sickle cell disease in countries where they weren't even kind of transplanting these patients. So you know, this is this is amazing. And a lot of the work of Jenna Dare and, and hopefully, you know, with in vivo technologies, and this may also improve accessibility. But these are also in countries where the healthcare spending is about $65 uh, you know, per per person per year. So um, you know, it is a, a stretch to think about how we bring these innovative therapies to, to patients where they're needed most. So I think, <clears throat> I wonder though whether we're entering an area of broader inequitable access. So we've got this kind of traditional um, inequitability that I, I've talked about. We're also seeing now um, you know, a, a difference between what's available in the US and what's available in Europe. And I wonder, uh, you know, in the years to come with the um, sort of licensing of gene editing technologies with for sickle and, and the like, um, whether you're going to see you know, inequitable access even within the same country. So just moving back to the EMA um, and, and the, the sort of landscape in Europe, um, if we look at the approved advanced therapies uh, over this time period, what was great is that we're seeing more and more therapies being approved. But if you look at the white boxes, these are therapies that have actually been withdrawn or the license hasn't been renewed. Um, and so we're actually seeing an increase of that, which is which is also worrying. And this is acknowledged as a, as a challenge now. It's been reported in The Economist, in, in Nature Medicine, um, you know, that, that this is a problem and we have to uh, find a way around this. There's obvious barriers and, and, and one is, is, is cost. Um, you know, the list price for Zolgensma, which is SM for treatment for SMA, um, 1.8 million pounds, 2.4 million dollars, and 1.9 million euros. That's available in those three territories. Libmeldi, which is a lentiviral stem cell gene therapy for uh, uh, MLD, 2.8 million pounds, only available kind of in the UK at the moment. Zinteglo for transfusion-dependent thalassemia, 2.8 million dollars, only available in the US. And I think the strongest examples we have of this is Bluebird Bio and Orchard. So Bluebird Bio um, developed uh, you know, therapies for uh, transfusion-dependent thalassemia and ALD uh, in Europe with European centers, trialed it there, uh, licensed it there, uh, but was unable to reach a kind of a reimbursement um, a agreement with the European nations and so withdrew from European market. So now we're in a position where those therapies are available in the US. Uh, and not in Europe. Uh, Orchard Therapeutics uh, span out of, of UCL and Great Ormond Street. You know, its portfolio is based on in one areas of immunity. Um, however, uh, shortly, um, uh, you know, shortly uh, before 2021, they um, dropped the in one areas program, gave the IP back to the centers that had developed it and focused on in another area. 
um, you know, this this all really leaves the patient communities and physicians, um, you know, frustrated and disappointed when it's known that an effective treatment exists yet we can't access it for our patients. Um, and I, I talked to you earlier about the cost of developing a traditional drug. Well, the cost of developing a gene therapy. I mean, I think five billion, as estimated by the IGI, is is is, is high, um, but it is certainly expensive and higher than uh, the cost of developing a traditional drug. So if I just focus on ex vivo gene therapy for ultra rare diseases, because that's kind of the area that I work in the past three years, six gene therapy products have been dropped by commercial manufacturers for non medical reasons. So to achieve sustainable and affordable access to these transformative therapies for patients with rare uh, diseases, we feel the evolution of the system is needed. Um, and we're looking at ways to create a an alternative to the conventional commercialization model. Not being competitive, if a company wants to develop something and they're gonna continue that, then that's great. And we're looking at areas where there's um, sort of essentially non-commercially viable products. And I just picked this um, table <clears throat> out of a review that the Milan group did in Nature Medicine in, in 2022 that I definitely you know, point you towards. But this is just a table of kind of the inborn errors of immunity um, uh, work that's been done. But what this represents is decades of research and millions of, of euros and pounds in public funding. And for those that are in clinical trial and have been approved by the EU, you know, significant tangible patient impact. And I think one of the issues which we all appreciate is that regulatory frameworks are not built for advanced therapies. They were built for high throughput drugs like paracetamol and high blood pressures, um, you know, which is it, the framework is just not suited to precision medicine. And there are lots of regulatory initiatives which are looking to address this. So the European Medical Agency, EMA, has a pilot project specifically to support academic uh, therapies uh, through to license with additional kind of uh, you know, financial uh, support and, and advice. Um, Peter Marks is a strong advocate of this um, and the FDA you know, last year um, announced Operation Warp Speed for rare diseases. So learning on some of the, the, um, the experience from the COVID, um, how things can be brought, uh, brought more quickly to clinic and also um, the Orbis project, which has, has been announced really again, focused on, on rare diseases. There's lots of national initiatives in Europe, bringing stakeholders together earlier to be able to kind of get the therapies to patients earlier. And then we're moving towards platform technologies, which I'll, I'll just talk very kind of very briefly about. Um, earlier this year, the UK MHRA said that they would recognise foreign regulatory approvals. Um, so having accelerated sign off for medicines approved by trusted regulators, um, which is a huge step forward, uh, and also an accelerated approvals process for the most impactful new medicines. So that includes kind of rare disease therapies. So I think, you know, there is improved support to licensing and there are certainly initiatives and, and enthusiasm there. But it's after that that I think there's a bit of a death valley. So um, a, a quick sideline of you know, these therapies are coming. How do we pay? Um, well, how do we address affordability? Um, you know, as, as you know, very recently, you know, Kazgevi has been approved uh, in the UK and, and in the US for two indications now. Um, so, so these treatments are here. Um, although they have got, you know, a, a sort of a stunningly high price um, uh, up front, these therapies can be cost effective if you consider the offset cost of chronic illness and, for example, high cost of enzyme replacement therapy in some of these conditions. And many people are looking at different financial models for reimbursement with like payment by results, so an upfront payment and then you know, further instalments when you demonstrate durability of treatment, um, drug mortgages, Netflix subscription models. Um, but I think one thing that it's really difficult to do is to um, accurately estimate the cost of current treatments to be able to put, um, you know, to demonstrate that gene therapies can be um, uh, cost effective. And of course, there's the differences between multi-payer uh, and single-payer systems, which we have between our, our, our countries. Um, and there are alternative approaches coming through as well, which are not for profit. Um, there's something called the hospital exemption program, which is uh, available in Europe. Um, and the best example of this is um, Julia Delgado in the hospital clinic in Barcelona, where they developed a, a CAR T cell academically. Uh, they were able to give it to patients in their hospital and the Spanish uh, agencies reimbursed them for that. However, uh, hospital exemption is limited to treating patients in a single center. Um, and uh, so you know, it's, it's, it's not really a sustainable approach. 
Um, we're seeing venture philanthropy or private um, public private partnerships. Uh, that are that are maybe trying to address this not for profit entities like the the GGTI and, and Billiman and the Gates Foundation, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about academic consortia. Um, before I do that, I want to say another thing that's that I'm seeing more more frequently is is patients and families trying to embark on this journey in a desperate hope to find a, a cure for their patients, and we've seen it with Mila's Miracle, which was an ASO therapy. Um, uh, for, for, for Mila, uh, which has led to, to Milasen. Um, and, and, and this is um, uh, this is a journey of uh, Terry Pirovalakis for uh, SPG50, which is a devastating neurodegenerative disease. And I'm showing this because, um, you know, I just want to show you kind of what is possible. Um, so his son, Michael, was diagnosed on the 2nd of April 2019. Um, this He had no kind of scientific background or, or, or involvement in this field. Um, he pulled together a team, fundraised like crazy, uh, was able to basically um, uh, dose Michael on the 24th of March 2022 uh, uh, under an IND. Uh, and so this demonstrates what's possible, but we can't rely on patients and families, um, you know, to, to, to make these therapies possible. So moving forwards. Um, Milan, uh, uh, San Rafael, Telethon, you know, these were the pioneers in, in Europe who, who, um, who developed Strimvelis, uh, which Orchard licensed and was able to, um, uh, to, to treat patients uh, through that. However, when Orchard dropped the program, they gave the IP back to uh, Milan, who have, uh, have come up with a not-for-profit model of being able to deliver that to, to patients still. Uh, and that's the first example we've seen of, of kind of an institution and a charity uh, doing that. So that's, a, that's an amazing step forward. Platform approaches are being you know, addressed by um, you know, San Rafael. We'll be testing this with the EMA. You've got Pave GT in the US looking at AAV platform approaches for for, um, for AAV therapies. Um, and, and basically, the premise for the lentiviral stem cell gene therapies, which I hope we'll, we'll test later in later this year in Europe. Yeah, you know, these are lentiviral backbone, the same backbone, just the transgene is different. We've done the same preclinical studies. It's the same manufacture process. It's the same uh, clinical protocol. So how can we reduce repetition and reduce cost without compromising safety for patients? And that's what we're going to explore with the EMA later this year. So um, a few, uh, 2022, uh, together with some colleagues around Europe, uh, we founded the Agora Initiative, which is now the Agora Foundation, which roughly stands for Access to Gene Therapies for Rare Diseases. Um, and our mission really was to facilitate the access to effective gene therapies for the treatment of patients with ultra rare diseases in Europe. And we brought together these different countries who had been um, yeah, all centers that had been involved in developing and delivering uh, gene therapies for inborn areas of immunity and metabolism, and also IPOPI, which is an international patient organization for primary immune deficiencies. So the patient populations that have been hit hardest by the disinvestment in the area. So we had a first workshop in London in September 2022, and we had this really grand kind of goal of um, creating this independent, sustainable, not-for-profit entity which could support marketing authorization, delivery, and access to these therapies. We've modified our goals slightly since then, um, but this was a fantastic meeting with like 50 people from multiple stakeholder perspectives from around Europe. We had developers, patient groups, regulators, funders, and, and even some, we invited six industrial partners and, and two came. <clears throat> but really looking uh, for solutions. We published the kind of proceedings of this in, in, in Nature Medicine last year. And since then, you know, and I think this just demonstrates the, the, the significance of this issue and the enthusiasm there is to make progress here. You know, we've been invited to talk at multiple kind of conferences and summits and, and, and contribute to publications as well. I'm showing you this not just to show you that, every, you know, that everybody is uh, everybody looks healthy and and uh, and <laughs> aggressive, but um, you know, the fact that we have an amazing supervisory board and executive board of people who've been involved in this field for a long time and have a huge wealth of experience is just a testament to how much people care about this and want to make something happen for the patients that they've spent you know, decades developing treatments for. Um, so our, our focus is really around harmonizing pan-European national activities and supporting not-for-profit and academic centers to deliver licensed products to patients and advocate really for standardized proportionate regulatory approaches. We're looking at ways that we can data share um, to de-risk and streamline safety assays, like maybe through the use of data repositories um, and creating this international collaborative network of centers where we can deliver these therapies. So we're hoping to be able to fill that gap from licensing to patient delivery. And I'll just give you very briefly an example of, of how we think it might work from our massive uh, sort of goal that we had originally to what we think it's going to look like. 
So we see the academic center, which developed the therapy being the marketing authorization holder, the manufacturing center, and responsible for post-licensing surveillance. But there will be other centers in different countries that want to access those therapies for their patients. So we see Agora as being kind of like a, a facilitator, um, work sharing and, um, and having sort of helping uh, sites set up uh, and engaging with HTAs and national regulatory agencies. Um, because if you think about it, you know, the regulatory dossiers are very similar between all of the different countries, but the centers that want to be able to deliver these therapies to their patients may not have the resources to embark on that journey themselves. So we want to help in that way. So we're finalizing a prototype disease in which we're going to be able to demonstrate that this pipeline works. And then hopefully once it's set up, it'll be easier uh, for things to come through. And so can we find a sustainable access model through this pathway? We think it is absolutely possible to have not-for-profit ATMP manufacture at these academic sites. Uh, we can offer a favorable cost ben benefit um, analysis versus standard treatment. And we think because our cost will be a cost recovery or not-for-profit, um, we will be able to be reimbursed by payers in those national centers. So I'm going to finish on this slide, obviously, Jennifer Doudna, um, who uh, announced uh, a couple of weeks ago now the uh, Danaha IGI beacon for CRISPR cures, so essentially CRISPR cures for all. So I'm fully behind that concept and I'm looking forward to the day when it's possible. But really, until we address some of these challenges um, and undo some of these blocks, um, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to get there. So I'm just going to briefly thank all of the people who did the work. This is the group who did a lot of the work on the XLP um, and the, the CTLA-4. Um, on the, this is our uh, gene therapy group uh, from five years ago uh, who uh, were involved in, in the clinical trials that I've shown here uh, and uh, just a wider number of people who've been involved across many different continents and our funders as well. So that was kind of really a whistle-stop tour, both like the science and the the social responsibility elements. Um, and I'm really happy to take any questions if you've got time for any of that. Thanks, Claire. Um, if you guys have questions, you can either put them in the chat or just... Um, oh, I see a chat. Um, maybe I can start with one, Claire. The, um, you know, you have this challenge of license of licensed therapies and then delivering them. What about the challenge of getting you that, getting through the earlier stages, which also I think is a huge hurdle for most. Yeah, I mean, like the clin like funding the clinical trials is is a significant hurdle. I mean, I think we can all generally get funding for our preclinical studies, um, but then the the clinical studies are. are are worse and I think so I think two things that we can do to kind of improve that so one is that um, you know if we can demonstrate that there's an academic pipeline that can get this to patients at the end of the day then that does make funders more amenable uh, to um, you know to to fund you know, to, to funding those clinical trials um, and we have in in, in Europe and the UK um, you know the opportunity to apply to quite a lot of charity funders who have philanthropic donations that are you know, willing to to invest in things that are not profit and you know, they don't expect any kind of return on. Um, so we're, we're lucky in that aspect. Um, but also, you know, when we're talking to regulators about clinical trial design, you know, pragmatism around how many patients need to be included in that, you know, what, what, um, uh, you know, what data we can, can use from other trials and other situations um, and essentially the platform approaches, which will hopefully uh, ultimately reduce the cost of the trials, uh, you know, because a lot of that, you know, like if you think about the amount of work and money that has to go into, um, you know, the validation of your GMP and this, this kind of CMC side of things, you almost need a whole batch of vector to, to be able to do that. Uh, and so if we can, you know, use previously, uh, you know, all data on, for example, lentiviral transduction protocols and, and GMP scalability of that, we're hoping that that will you know that sort of thing will cut costs do you think that will be feasible across because in like in the fda they're definitely not going there yet um and i'm wondering if in europe will that be feasible i think it's i think we're going to test it in europe um and uh i mean i I think that you know, there's definitely a recognition across all regulatory, you know, all the, the global regulatory agencies that um, there is this unmet need for non-commercially viable rare disease therapies. Um, and so 
you know, nobody's asking for like a two-tier system where we're not reaching a safety standard or uh, you know, a, a manufacturer standard um, that's comparable to you know commercial products. We're absolutely not asking for that. Um, but you know we are asking that there could be some you know, flexibility around the you know, the submission dossiers uh, in terms of like sharing of data. Um, actually, the regulatory agencies have have said to us um, that. Um, it, it, it's difficult to get academics, academic developers to share their data. Um, it's, it's impossible to get commercial developers to share their data so that these things can be aligned. Uh, but it's extremely difficult to get academic developers uh, to, to share as well. Um, so that's some something that we're also going to work on in Europe, because I mean, I think, uh, you know, given the, the sort of commercial feasibility here, and that I think, you know, it's pretty well established now that these ultra rare diseases um, are not going to be commercially feasible. Um, you know that 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 maybe there's a, a a greater inclination to data sharing to get your your treatment to patients. So Claire, in in view of the tremendous progress in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Do you think, and, and uh, you know, the in improvement in graft versus host mm -hmm. disease prevention in finding donors, do you think that gene therapy will be eventually replace hematopoietic stem cell transplantation? Thanks, Hans. Um, yeah, I do, for certain conditions. So I think like for the skid conditions, you can't, you know, I, I really think for like for ADA and XGID, where we've proven time and time again in trials um, that these therapies are effective and safe and durable, um, I, I think absolutely these could become standard of care. Even if you've got a matched sibling donor available, we're offering patients, you know, a, a, a choice, um, and there'll be factors in that around timing and availability. Um, but you know, I think for those things, it, it's true, and even for Wiscott, I think you know the results have been you know, fantastic from uh, from Milan, um, uh, durable results, and so I think that for those those conditions, they could become standard of care because if we can if we can offer them in uh, at a at a cost that is you know, amenable to a payer, uh, then yeah. or even comparable to transplant or less than transplant, then they become even more effective. Even more attractive, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, you... I, I think we, we all agree that the cost is a, a, a major um, problem. And uh, you know, for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, it's reasonable, uh, affordable. And to, for instance, in India, they do it for thirty, forty thousand dollars so that that is i think is the most important aspect for introducing gene therapy into the mainstream of of uh, genetic correction so i think that's one thing that i kind of wanted to 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 highlight is um you know so in the uk we have a generally a standard cost for transplant um but that does not really take into account the complexity of some of the transplants and the additional therapies that may be needed. So for example, patients with TMA uh, who require, you know, expensive ecolizumab for six months or so, or patients who require ECP for chronic GVHD, you know, these are costs that are not um, captured in, in when we think about transplant. And so we need to be able to do that a little bit more uh, clearly to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of gene therapy me, which which negates you know a, a lot of those um a lot of those costs related to allo reactivity um and we know what it costs to make a a, a a cell therapy product because we've all costed it for grants and we've done it for you know, we've done it for um we've done it for 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 Charles and beyond um and it's not two million dollars um it's not even two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> So um, yeah, I think I think when we when we can be open and transparent about the the cost of these therapies, uh, let's say in an academic setting, uh, then um, I think it's a, a, a I think it's a it's a really attractive option. It's certainly worthwhile to put a lot of energy into it and move it forward. Well, I think no questions doesn't mean that you're not. 
providing a lot of really useful, exciting information here. So, <laughs> right. so I think there's. I appreciate it's very early on a Friday morning. <laughs> no, I, I had a question. So, um, Fyodor Ernov from uh, from the Duna, you know, Institute ended up coming and and speaking a lot about the the troubles with. Um, the regulatory process for each individual mutation. So I was just curious on the the European side, um, as you're thinking about taking some of these novel technologies, or even considering a patient with an un, uncharacterized, you know, genetic variant. How do you fit that into the regulatory process? Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard the regulators asked openly about this at several meetings, um, and they're all, you know, I I mean. I think there is a pragmatism around this, and there's an understanding that um, you know, the, the platform approach to private mutations, you know, is there's going to be some um, there's going to be some kind of redundancy and some things that can be, you know, um, it, some things that will be accepted as the same. Um, but there's still going to be work needed around the um, you know the fact that you know your guide or like what you're changing around that, but hopefully not so much detail required around the um you know the system per se um they've been really positive you know i mean peter marx has said at various meetings and and the ema has also said um you know that they they'll consider um you know they're looking at ways to consider these private mutations um and i think one of the one of the examples actually the mhra has done really recently is the um mrna vaccines uh, cancer mrna vaccines and i don't know if that's something that's moving forward in the us but essentially that's like a platform approval um where they've approved that as a platform and then just changing the you know the kind of target antigen um and so i think if that you know, pans out and, and moves forward that actually paves the way a little bit for what we're trying to do as well. Yeah, thanks. There was a question in the conference room. Guys, go ahead. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great, um, well, great talk, thank you very much. And I was wondering, I'm not very familiar with like lentiviral and gene therapy situation, but I was wondering how scalable is it and would it be worth like focusing on automating a lot of this like you know instead of needing 10 people in a lab why don't you just like get a you know like these liquid handlers and you just automate the whole process like would you be able to do that or is it not feasible um i'm i'm not sure i mean it's a very it's a very complex process that i think um you know it can be variable between operators and things, um, but I, I don't think that the, I don't think the people time and the kind of it is not the it's not the main cost. I think automating that process is not going to cut down the cost um, significantly. The main costs are around the vector itself um, and the kind of the development cost as well. Um, but talking about diseases that you know, affect maybe like ten patients in Europe a year. Like if you if you wanted to think about X skid or ADA skid, um, you know, with one center manufacturing for the whole of Europe, um, we'd only be manufacturing you know, maybe ten products a year, um, and so yeah, I think that's um that's something that you know, the kind of experience necessary for that probably requires you know, people rather than machines. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks very much, Claire, for a really great talk and and raised a lot of important questions that we're going to be dealing with for a while, I think. <laughs> well, thanks so much for inviting me. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.